it's still the throwback weekend till at least midnight, right? How's it going everyone? My name is Eric. <coughs> Oh, it's too tight. How's it going, everyone? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. And yeah, I think this uh, throwback weekend, as far as I can tell, was a pretty big success. I just got done watching the Bojangles Southern 500, the 69th ever Southern 500. Nice. And boy, it looked like a party out there. Packed house stands were full. Throwback schemes looked perfect. Honestly, I think this year might be the best overall year as far as throwback schemes are concerned since they started doing the throwback race a few years ago. All in all, this entire evening feels just about perfect for NASCAR. But then why do I still feel empty inside? Honestly, not for really any good reason. I'm a newly converted Kyle Larson fan, just so to see him dominate that race and come so close and lose it at the end there was a little disappointing. But happy for Brad Keselowski because Brad Keselowski running a Rusty Wallace tribute paint scheme uh, got his first win of the year. I know that's right, Brad Keselowski, a former champion, guy who's always in the playoffs. He made it to Homestead last year as part of the Final Four. Hadn't won a race yet this year until this weekend at Darlington. Pretty big deal for him, his first ever Southern 500 win. In fact, he hadn't even won at Darlington before until the Xfinity race yesterday. So he swept the weekend and got his first two wins uh, ever at Darlington. So crazy good weekend for Keselowski. But man, oh man, this race kind of had an old school feel to it. Not just because of the throwback paint schemes or, you know, the old classic venue or, you know, anything like that. But no, really more in how the race was run. Kyle Larson dominated one stage one and one stage two and looked poised to sweep the stages, win the race, and get himself some much needed bonus points going into the playoffs. But fast forward to like lap 340 out of 367, and uh, during a caution pit stop stops, uh, Kyle Larson's pit crew got him out just behind Brad Keselowski. The two team was speedy, and the 42 team was not speedy enough, so uh, Larson lost his advantage on the restart and fell back and finished third. So it kind of felt like an old school race. There wasn't a whole lot of big major incidents. There was a big wreck when a Clint Boyer ran into Ryan Newman, when Newman was pitting and Boyer didn't realize it and you know, it was too late and he just ran over the back of him. There was a lazy spin here or there from some back marker team. So, you know, it wasn't a lot of main big major incidents. There was a lot of long green flag runs, as a matter of fact. There was a couple points in this race where Larson had a 10, 15 second lead. So, you know, it kind of had an old school feel in some ways. But all in all, if I'm going to talk about the race as a whole, I thought it was an okay race, a decent race. I think Darling you know, typically produces uh, exciting racing. A lot of, uh, you know, the drivers have to work for it. There's no doubt about that. The drivers are working hard all night long. We didn't see as many Darlington stripes this year as I think we're used to seeing. Darlington is historically known for being one of the tougher tracks to drive on the Cup Series circuit. The drivers are typically right up there near that wall for 500 miles, and it's very easy to slip up and scrape that wall a little bit, hence the phrase Darlington stripe. But we really only saw a few guys get into the wall, so it was kind of not your typical Darlington race, but also a very typical Darlington old school style race at the same time. It was a confusing race to me, but I thought it was okay. Wasn't a lot of competition uh, for the lead most of the race, but a lot of pretty good competition from second on back. My biggest problem with this race is it was too hard for drivers to pass when they were on equal tires. You know, in stage three, we had some people on varying pitch strategies, which meant, which meant there was a lot of passing, but it was really, you know, it's because some drivers had old tires and some drivers had new tires and they would just blow by each other. You really didn't see a whole lot of like jockeying for position. You know, it was very difficult to, even when you had the faster car, to get inside of, of a guy and ultimately have enough momentum off the corner to keep your nose in there and make something happen. Happen. It was very difficult to do that. So it's a mixture of the track, a mixture of the aero package with these cars that kind of resulted in that. So, you know, the racing was fine. It was okay. But what I noticed is that a lot of the biggest, like, shufflings in the running order happened when, like, penalties happened. We had a lot of people who ran over the commitment line because pit road, getting on a pit road under green at Darlington is really difficult, apparently. I've only played the video game, and, I mean, yeah, it's pretty hard in there, too, so I, I guess it's hard in real life. But we had a lot of people run over the commitment line. We had uncontrolled tires. We had a couple people speeding. Like, it felt like penalties is what really did in a lot of people. I think of Jimmy Johnson early on, was running 14th, had driven from the back, he had to start in the rear, he drove up into the 14th position early in stage one, looked great, and then he had a commitment line violation. Now this is after he uh, he uh, had un or a loose wheel problem, so actually kind of Jimmy did himself in on multiple occasions, but still, you know, that really ended their day. They were a non-factor, and then later had to go to the garage with like an oil pump issue or something. We saw how Martin Truex Jr. went from battling in the top three to having a penalty, being multiple laps down, and again, was never really a factor after that. We didn't really see very many people come back from penalties. And a large reason for that was the lack of cautions for one, but also because it is hard to pass when you're all on equal tires. That's why when Brad Keselowski got out front of Larson on that final restart, 
you kind of knew that it, it was over. That's one thing that makes Darlington fun. You have incidents like you saw in the Xfinity race where you had Ross Chastain and Kevin Harvick run into each other and uh, racing for the lead. And things like that happen because the track is so narrow. There's really only one strong racing groove. You can kind of make a second one work, but it's really only a one groove track right up against the wall. So you get some dramatic incidents like that that are fun for the fans and exciting to watch and everything. But at the end of the day, it doesn't always produce the best, best racing. I hope people don't come after me because I know Darlington is a sacred track for NASCAR. and I love it. It's a great, great location for the throwback race. Like I said at the top of the show, this was a successful night for NASCAR. It was a good event, good race. But I personally think that the racing at Darlington is slightly overhyped. People act like it's as big a spectacle as Bristol or Daytona. And I'll be honest, Bristol's better. Daytona's better. And you can't change my mind on that. But I'm just going to say that. No, I'm just going to say it. Darlington's fine, but I think it's slightly overhyped. So there's my hot take for the episode. That's as hot as it's going to get in here. Actually, it's pretty hot in here. It's still summer and I'm wearing a jacket. But anyway, moving on, I want to talk about the top 20. I'm just going to talk about some of the top uh, finishers and some of the more notable storylines from this race. So there you go. Obviously, Brad Keselowski, I should spend a minute talking about him because this is a big weekend for him, like I said. Swept the weekend, won the Xfinity race and the cup race, obviously, his first win of the season. And this is a big deal because Team Penn Penske, we've talked about on this show, NASCAR's talked about, it's been pretty obvious that Penske has been lagging behind, uh, most notably, the other Fords, like Stuart Haas. I mean, Harvick, Kurt Busch, Clint Boyer have been better than Logano and Keselowski at the majority of race races this year. We've seen how Blaney has went from being really good at the beginning of the season, led a lot of laps, to now he's really hasn't been very good in a while. Logano and Keselowski had great runs at Darlington. They finished 1-2. Uh, Keselowski getting the win is a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is because we're about to start the playoffs. And uh, Brad Keselowski's a guy that has made it to the Final Four multiple times. He's a past champion back in 2012. So we expect a lot from, uh, really from all of Team Penske, but from Brad Keselowski especially. He's kind of supposed to be the leader of that team. Up until this point this year, he kind of underwhelmed us for the most part, I feel like. But getting a win at Darlington, having one of the best cars all night long at a challenging tra track. This is a driver's racetrack, so Brad Kozlowski is really able to showcase his talent and ability uh, and maybe make some believers out of some fans going into the playoffs. All the talk has been about the big three of Harvick, Kyle Busch, and Martin Truex Jr. And, you know, obviously the three of them, most they all ran top 10, top 5 most of the race as well, so they're still going to be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, but, you know, even if all three of them make it to Homestead, there's still one more spot at the end of this season. So could Brad Keselowski help vault his name into consideration with a strong run like tonight at Darlington? Maybe. I'm not sure if I'm ready to go there quite yet, but I think he definitely now, uh, I'm going to keep my eye on, eye on him the next couple weeks because he, he could maybe be on the rise at just the right time. Joey Logano in second, I could say the same thing about him. He had that win at Talladega earlier this year, but other than that, he's been okay. He's been consistent, which is why he's been pretty high in the point standings most of the year, but he hasn't really been like dominant any race weekend. He's not leading laps very often. He's not really contending for wins. So this was a good sight to see. Penske across the board, at least those two guys, especially Blaney's still, I'm not sure what to think of Ryan Blaney right now, but those two guys, Keselowski and Logano, uh, made a statement this weekend. They did. Finishing first and second at Darlington makes a statement. No matter what you've done the whole season, that makes a statement. And uh, I'm just, I'll be interested to see what they do going forward. We got Indy next week. And then was it, I think Vegas to start the playoffs, a mile and a half. I'll be really curious to see what they do in a mile and a half because that's kind of the baseline. If you run well a mile and a half, so usually that means you're running well in general and you have a real chance at the championship. So uh, that'll be that'll be the real test in a couple weeks. But this is a good start. Kyle Larson finished his third. Still a good day for him. He got a couple playoff points now, which he didn't have before. But man, you win stage one, you win stage two, you lead like 300 laps or something. You expect to win the race. And at the end of the day, it came down to about a half a second or so he lost on pit road when compared to Keselowski because if, if Larson uh, wins the race off pit road there with 20 to go. I think he goes on to win the race. It was too hard to pass on equal tires. He was going to win that race, no problem probably, uh, but pit stops were cost him. He fell back to third on the restart and couldn't go anywhere from there. It was just the way it was. It's kind of how Darlington was all night, so uh, it's disappointing for Larson. Uh, he's another guy with Keselowski that we think could maybe be that fourth guy at Homestead, uh, and this was you know, he didn't win, but it still does kind of feel like a statement race for him. Really, this whole top three is very interesting to me because this felt like a race where the big three didn't dominate. We didn't really see Kyle Busch ever break the top five. Harvick was up there sometimes, but not really a threat. And Truex, same thing. He had a penalty and really wasn't a threat either. So this was really a race where we got to see the other guys shine. We saw Eric Jones run top five. We saw Kurt Busch run top five. 
Guys that have won this year that have also been discussed as possible championship threats. Same with Chase Elliott. We had all these guys up in the top five. Chase Elliott, Eric Jones, Kurt Busch, the Penske guys of Logano and Keselowski, and Kyle Larson. I would honestly say those are the six drivers behind the big three that have the best chance of making something happen. And all six of those guys I just named were consistently in or around the top five for most of tonight's race. And that's interesting to me that they all chose this weekend to really step up. It might be something like coming off the off weekend, they're like, dang, we got to make something happen. The playoffs are about to roll in. We're about to start the playoffs. we got to make something happen. Let's see what we got. And it looks like all these teams brought their best stuff and showed that when they're at their best, they can beat Harvick. They can beat Kyle Busch, and they can beat Martin Truex Jr. So this is actually really optimistic to me if you're a fan. If you're just a casual fan of NASCAR that wants to see, see something happen and you're tired of the big three, this is a very optimistic race. When you have the Penske guys, when you have Larson, and you have... Jones and Elliott and Bush and other guys like that really run well and beat the big three this weekend. That's what they did. They beat the big three collectively. And I think that's exciting because this makes it sound like maybe it won't just be a sweep all the way to Homestead where we're just going to watch Harvick and Bush and Truex dominate. No, it looks like now maybe Keselowski could throw his name into the ring. Maybe you get Kyle Larson up there. Eric Jones or Chase Elliott. Some of these young guys maybe could make something happen. This was an exciting race for that reason and that reason alone. I think that's what we should take away from this, that... When they bring something good to the track, which they probably all did coming off the off weekend, this was a, circled on all of their calendars, when they bring their best stuff, they can run with the big three. And more importantly, as we see there, they can beat the big three. And I'm just saying, this could, be, this could, be, this could mean that it's not going to be a blowout in the playoffs. And I'm excited. Harvick finishes fourth, Chase Elliott fifth, like I said. Kurt Busch, Kyle Busch, Eric Jones. Jamie McMurray ninth, which is pretty impressive given that they blew an engine basically at the start of the weekend and had to go to a backup engine or had to replace an engine. Uh, so to come back with the top 10 is pretty good for them. Denny Hamlin finished 10th, really had an up and down day. Started good, he started up front, you know, ran well early on, but faded pretty quickly and came back for a top 10 in a very nice throwback car, I must say. Uh, so solid performance for them, but they're still kind of maybe lagging a little further behind than they'd like to be at this point. Truex 11th, Ricky Stenhouse 12th, not too bad for the for the Roush Fenway Ford right there. Chris Buescher a solid 13th, good for him. Eric Almarola 14th, Blaney back there in 15th. You have Austin Dillon 16th, who was kind of one of the highlights of the race when he and Kyle Larson battled at the end of stage one. Dillon was trying to stay on the lead lap, squoze Larson into the wall a little bit, who was leading the race at the time. At the time, we worried that there could be damage on Larson's car. There's a lot of uh, conflicting opinions on whether or not what Austin Dillon did was fair or foul. I actually ran a poll on Twitter, which I want to go and show you guys, because if you don't remember the incident, uh, Austin Dillon was fighting to stay on the lead lap, uh, coming to, I think it was on the final lap of stage one. Uh, Kyle Larson rolled outside of him. Uh, he was to the outside of Austin Dillon, and Austin Dillon, not knowing he wasn't clear, or maybe he did know he wasn't clear and just chose to do this anyways, uh, ran Larson up into the wall. They both hit the wall, both made contact. Austin Dillon ultimately held on to the spot, stayed on the lead lap, but a lot of people on Twitter were upset on both sides about whether that was a dirty move, whether or not that was fair because he's racing to stay on the lead lap, yada, yada, yada. I asked you guys if it was fair or foul, and honestly, the, uh, the final report was very, very close. Just over half of you guys said it was fair, that you thought it was fair for Austin Dillon to uh, run and Kyle Larson out of room uh, to stay on the lead lap at stage one, and that's what you guys said. I 100% disagree with you. I'll go ahead and say that. I 100% believe what Austin Dillon did was a dirty move, a bad move. Uh, stage one, I get that you're trying to stay on the lead lap, but Kyle Larson had like a seven second lead at the time. He was clearly the best car. He just made a casual move. He was to your outside. You were not clear. If you're Austin Dillon, you were not clear, and you chose to run him up into the wall. At the end of the day, it was kind of a non-story because Larson didn't really sustain any major damage. It didn't hurt his car in any way. So at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. But it could have been a big issue. It could have been a major incident, and I thought it was just careless and reckless on Austin Dillon's part, personally, and I, I just don't think you should intentionally run somebody into the wall like that just to protect your position, especially when that person you're running into the wall is the race leader and you're about to go a lap down. Just saying, that, that's my opinion, but obviously about half of you guys, a little more than half of you guys, seem to disagree with me, but... I mean, let me know in the comments. Going back to looking at the top 20, you have Paul Menard there, David Reagan, who was consistently in the top 20, Ryan Newman, and then Michael McDowell. So, uh, yeah, there's your top 20 finishers from this weekend's race. And that's really all I have to say in this episode. Not a whole lot else to say. I mean, it was a solid race, a decent race, not going to blow anyone's mind, not, not anything to super write home about. Uh, but like I said at the beginning, I feel like it had kind of an old school feel. Now, I'm a young fan. Maybe I'm not the right person to make that comparison. Uh, but any of you guys, any of you old school fans who've been around a while, let me know in the comments what you thought of tonight's race because I thought it was fun. It was kind of a nice, 
it was a relaxing race, I feel like, because like I said, there wasn't a lot of ma major incidents, there wasn't a lot of big wrecks or like crazy drama with anybody, nothing too bad. Uh, I thought it was hilarious when, you know, after the Dylan Larson had their first run in at the end of stage one, at the end of stage two, Larson was once again about to lap Austin Dillon, and uh, he actually managed to beat him to the line by about half a car length. So I thought that was kind of funny to see Larson kind of get the last laugh in that whole uh, incident. But other than that, I felt like this race was just kind of laid back, just kind of a typical laid back, I mean, it was Sunday night, but it kind of felt like a laid-back Saturday night uh, race under the lights. But it was fun. Hope you guys enjoyed it because uh, throwback weekend, clearly, by the, by the amount of people in those stands and at that race, clearly the throwback weekend is a hit with fans. And uh, I'll probably make an episode actually in a few days talking a little bit more about that, what the... the the more what I think the throwback weekend really does for NASCAR. I might talk about that a little bit. I'll talk more about this race and I'll talk about uh, any other news that comes out. So thanks for watching. As per usual, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. Those links are down below. Thank you to our amazing Patreon sponsors of Out of the Groove. You guys keep this show uh, rolling, keep this show growing. And uh, it really means a lot to me. So you too can be a Patreon sponsor. If you check out that top link down below, you can see how, uh, how you can uh, become one of those fine people. But yeah, anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again later this week. Uh, yeah, got nothing else to say. Appreciate the support. And uh, hope you guys had a fun time tonight. See you, everyone.